Check, check, testing one, two, testing one, two. What's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? Words are hard. Tell me if you can hear me. Tell me if you can hear me. Okay. Um, about to let me go change this to unlisted for my lovely patrons. Um, so you better get in here quick. It's about to go unlisted. Let me go to edit. It's gonna be fun. It follows. It follows. We've been planning this freaking stream for guys. It might be way before the move, probably like four months, something like that. But yeah, yeah, we've been we've been planning this for a long time. But looking forward to watching this this great film with you guys. This great film with you guys. Let me turn on my fan. It's freaking hot. It's freaking hot. Uh, you better watch it. You better watch it, Lindsay. <laughs> you know, I was looking on stream. I think the only way you can stream this is like, well, I think you can, you can buy it through like Amazon and Vudu. Um, uh, I'm sure Lindsay would play, uh, pay full price, but um, let me see. Let me, let me go change this. Hold on. Uh, unlisted, unlisted. There we go. Here we go. Unlisted. All right, done and save. There we go. Okay, guys, we're in our own little private room now, okay? Just me and you guys. If you made it in uh, and you're not a patron, congratulations. I'm, that's cool. I like that. I like to have a, a few people in here. But um, the reason I do that, too, the reason I leave that public is because used to, I would put it unlisted and I put it on my patron page and I get it. We all have lives. And by the time the stream comes, most people forget, you know, and there's no way of letting them know unless they constantly go back to the to the patron page or the the the, the Facebook Patreon extension. So I figured, you know what, I think the best way is just so it's always in their site. I put it on the uh, as public and then I just make it unlisted once once we go live. So if a few people get in extra, that's fine. That's fine. We can all have a good time. Right. There you go. But uh, man. It this movie, this movie's so divisive. That's one thing I've noticed, like over the last couple of years, just how divided this movie is. I can't believe this movie came out in 2000, 2015. So what? Seven years ago, this movie, this movie came out my first year of YouTube, actually. But we're, we're going to get into uh, all that. Uh, but are you are you guys ready to hit the play button? I'd say at least like five of you let me know let me know that you're ready to hit the play button and then we'll do it we'll do it and uh we'll discuss it follows i've been waiting to do this forever too and i'm gonna turn my volume up just a little bit even though you don't want to you don't want the youtube police to to hear the movie because then they could take the stream down but hold on there we go Okay, cool. All right, ready. I see some readies. Can't believe this movie is almost 10 years old. Yeah, it's getting there. Amstel hated it on the first viewing. I'm going to talk about my first viewing, okay? I'm going to talk about my first viewing. One of my first 10 reviews, I think, Lindsay. Yeah, you know what? I always say the class of 2015. Because there were a lot of us that started that year, I notice. So it's kind of cool to think back to that time period, you know, and reflect on the the people that started, the friends that we all made. And, you know, it's not a bad thing, but some people, they they did it for a little bit and then they moved on, you know. And I still see them on, like, social media, but they, they haven't done YouTube in, like, years, you know. So it's kind of interesting to to kind of, I don't know, observe that. You know, and you always think that too, like, is, is, uh, am I going to stay with this thing for a long time or am I going to, you know, stop it? You don't know when you start, you know, it's, it's, it was completely new to me. So, but let's go ahead. I'm going to count us down and we're going to hit play on it follows. Okay. We're going to play on it follows. What's up, Beth? All right. So, 
I, we always go from 10, right guys? So a 10, 9, 8, a 7, a 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, bingo. Almost a disco. Because I watched Pulp Fiction the other night. Well, you, guys, if you want, like, this is laid back. We can talk about other movies too. But mostly we're going to be talking about It Follows. But, you know, we're, we're real loose. Like, I just watched, um, I didn't know this was Dimension. I didn't know this. Now, is I don't think It Follows is A24, even though, am I right on that, guys? Like, I'm no expert. But this is a movie that screams A24. But I don't think it is. And I've been corrected on that quite a few times, I think. Hey, this is not an A24 movie. But, I mean, it. I mean, would you guys agree with that? This, Even if you don't like the movie, doesn't this feel like an A24 movie? Am I right on that? It really does. You know? This feels more like A24 than X does. Derek said he saw X yesterday, and my God, so good. Hell yeah. X was freaking amazing. Um... I even, I even made my, oh my God, what guys, uh, we're on this opening scene. Now, if you pay attention to this scene, this feels like it could take place after or before the events of this movie. I just hit my, my mic. Uh, you got this character, Annie, that's running out of the, uh, the house. By the way, she was named after Annie from John Carpenter's Halloween, right? But... Right away, they grab your attention with this shot, you know, because you're wondering, like, what is coming after her? You you kind of get the vibe that you can't see it, you know, because, because the person on the right of her is just grabbing their groceries and they're not noticing anything. And if it was if you could see somebody, then that person that's grabbing their groceries on the right side of the screen uh, would have reacted as well. But no, it's not that at all. So camera's just slowly panning tracking her movements all the way around right away this movie grabs you it really grabs you yeah just, <laughs> the guy's like what's going on what's the matter <laughs> it's almost like everybody else around her like like oh 1492 isn't that a a, a number of a, a certain house is it 1492 elm street is that is that right i'm thinking on the fly here guys listen to this music okay this music is so freaking good like i want to turn it up just a little bit by the way i do have the b cam hold on let me pull up the b cam Just so I can show you. Um, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there's the scene that we're on right now. And she's uh, she's running away from it. And, and then she's on the beach. Just real, real quick, you know. So uh, it, it kind of starts off with a bang. But it's still... Like one... One aspect of this, oh, it's 1428. Thank you very much. 1428. Why was that? What did I say? 1492? Something is 1492. I've heard that number before. I've heard that number before. Pay attention to the technology in this movie, too, because the technology is all over the place. And that's, that's intentional. Um, David Robert Mitchell, the director of this movie, uh, he... He stated that this idea came from a dream. Um, or no, no, not a dream. But when he was young, he would have these this idea of this entity, ch you know, coming after you slowly. Kind of like uh, Night of the Living Dead, you know, and Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> the year I was born. True, true. In Night of the Living Dead, you have these zombies that are slowly coming after you. And... Uh, David Robert Mitchell has stated that uh, two of his biggest influences for this movie directing wise were John Carpenter and George Romero. Uh, and I can obviously see the Carpenter. I mean, even in this shot right here, you know, Carpenter always had those kind of slow pans, you know, and there's a few shots that look like they're completely ripped right out of Halloween. Um, but also Romero in the, the way that it, would come after people almost feeling zombie-like 
you know? Never fast. And here's my question for you guys, okay? Do you prefer fast zombies or slow zombies? Because I've kind of I'm kind of back and forth on this one. I guess it depends on the situation in the movie. But David Robert, Robert Mitchell stated that originally this the sex thing wasn't part of the original idea. The original idea was just a slow uh, object that could look like anything was coming after you. And then later on, he said in his in his adult years, he decided to make it a metaphor for STDs, you know? But this movie screams ambiguity. And, and some people don't like ambiguity in movies. Some people like things kind of spelled out for them or, or just give me enough information to get me there. You know, some people like that. Um, I'm the type of person that I kind of like filling in my own blanks with a story and the more ambiguous you can make it almost the better for me, as long as I can kind of come up with some kind of hypothesis for where the story, I don't know. I just really get a kick out of creating, you know, theater of the mind coming up with my own story. I love that. Make a Monroe, I think, killed it in this movie as Jay. Now, if you pay attention to like those two boys that are looking over the fence, you're going to see one of them later, you know, and David Robert Mitchell would put these little objects in the movie that almost guaranteed you wouldn't notice the first time you watch it. And then when you watch it again, it kind of pops out at you. But going back to what I was talking about, about the, the time frame of this movie, if I told you this took place in the 80s, you might believe me. If I told you this took place in the 90s, you might believe me. You know, you got a CRT television right there from the 90s. Uh, that was intentional because he wanted this whole movie to feel dreamlike. You know, he wanted it to feel like this is the only bit of current technology in the movie. That little makeup case with the with the Wi-Fi, which I don't even know if that exists today. So that could almost be like futuristic. I thought I would be talking like once every 10 minutes in this movie, but here I am. I can't shut my mouth about it. <laughs> you know? Uh, Brett says Meka Monroe is great. She has a new movie coming out this summer that looks interesting. Yeah, she, she's had a pretty interesting career so far. She did do the um, Independence Day Resurgence, which, hey, you got to collect a check, right? But my God. Uh, it's 1982 in my mind. Yeah, you, whatever. You know, that's the nice thing about ambiguity in movies. You can make it what you want, you know? Now, I will say a word on Disaster Pieces score here. I literally have the vinyl for this soundtrack, the score. Um, if if you're watching this movie for the first time, like I think Beth's watching this for the first time right now, if you, I would turn it up, turn it up because would you guys agree with me? Like the music is half the battle with this movie. Like the music is so good that it alone is is great. You know, and the story itself is great, but man. This movie is, a, is a, it's an experience. That's what it is to me, you know? It's not just the story. It's it's everything. The music, the direction, the the mood. This this movie is a mood for sure. And it's not like somebody was stating I was peeking the comments earlier and somebody was stating in the chat that uh Martyrs it makes this movie look like uh you know, like crap. I'm paraphrasing what they said, but uh how can you possibly compare this to martyrs? They're two completely different animals, okay? This isn't meant to be uh, a torture type film. You know, this is more dreamlike, like I was just saying, you know, more ambiguous. And that's fine. You know, you can, you can like both types of, uh, of movies. I, as a matter of fact, that's the way I am. I don't settle on one particular type. I think slashers are my favorite, but... Man, you give me a good story. I don't care what the what the uh, genre is. I'm in. You know, that's the big thing. So we're on the scene where Maka's going on, or Jay. Uh, by the way, she's named after Jamie Lee Curtis. That that was the inspiration. J J uh, J for JLC. Jamie Lee Curtis. But uh, she's going on a date with uh, this guy. He, he he's in a show. I've seen him in a show with Scott Speedman. I think. But uh, pretty. Uh, I think it's called. Shit, I can't remember the name of the show. Damn it! But yeah, 
But this is where the story really kind of kicks into high gear. So pretty early on. Uh, Eric says, the score is amazing. I've got it up there with The Descent. Yes, yes. The Descent is also one of my favorite scores of like the last, God, I would say 15, what, it's 15 years now since The Descent came out? It's insane. 2007, yeah. Uh, Adrian, are you going to see Morbius? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely going to check out Morbius. Not hearing good things. Never, th- uh, you know, just from the, the original trailers for that movie, it doesn't look that good. You know, Sony's really hit and miss with their movies as far as like superhero movies go. Very hit and miss. And the CGI already looks terrible. So I love how he picks the kid big early hint on what's to come. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a cool scene because they're sitting in a theater and they're playing this game and he pokes or he points at somebody and nobody sees that person. She doesn't see that person. So automatically this is that type of horror. That's not like a jump scare. It's kind of like a a horror of the mind, you know, Uh, like you, you ever watch a movie and there's a certain scene that comes on and then a, a piece of information is presented and there's no, like reaction to it but there's something in your mind that goes off a scare that goes off that was exactly what that was when she's like i don't see anything and automatically the horror kicks in in your mind like oh shit so he sees it we know that really well done and i love when movies try different things to to, to put out a scare you know as simple as it sounds your basic goal is to put out a scare right here you're gonna get very little jump scares in this movie um this creeps me out to no end because you know that it is out there you see her um in the diner with her boyfriend and the camera look at the camera what it's doing you know this is very effective camera work here kind of blurring her out and putting in focus this object in the background this guy walking but still you don't know if he's actually it um here is the halloween uh, i call this the halloween scene i mean that is an exact tracking shot just like in the first movie um and here's a question for you guys too by the way would you like if halloween came out today would you consider it kind of like um like, could you see A24 putting out the first Halloween? That's a serious question. Think about that. Could you see H if Halloween came out today and it said A24 presents Halloween, would you do a double take or would you just see it as a basic slasher? No wrong answer, by the way. Actually, I think I can put that right there. Let's see if I go to the B cam. Hold on. There we go. That's where we are. It's a little crooked, but it'll do right. So that that way I'll give you guys an idea of where we are in the movie every time. Um, uh, Erica says, I don't think I'd do a double take because it's the first one. We wouldn't know what to expect yet. That's true. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. Um, Brian Bowden says, that's solid, man. I could see it being an A24 as well as uh, Blumhouse. Um, yeah, now I'll give you my answer to that. And, and like I said, there's no wrong or right answer. But I think the first Halloween could, you know, it could classify as an A24 movie because it is a slow burn. It does have some um, very experimental direction because keep in mind, not the first, but it was one of the first uh, Steadicam movies. Rocky was the first, but this was one of the first Steadicam movies. So 
Nobody had used Steadicam that much before. So everything was new and fresh and experimental, experimental young crew. Um, Michael Myers, you don't really see him that much until like the last act. Um, he pops in, in and out of frame here and there. Even the score sounds very, you know, A24-ish. So we're, we're starting to approach one of the, and there's a lot of scary moments in this movie, but we're, we're starting to approach uh, the, one of the scariest moments for sure. And um, I will say it freaked me out and it really got my attention. But you can see Jay and her boyfriend having sex. Uh, and then, you know, it's it's about to get real here in a minute. And, you know, Jay, if you consider this a slasher, Jay is, you know, the final girl. And she's unique because this is a final girl that does have sex. She she kind of blends in with um, um, girls that would get killed in movies, you know, and guys. So it's interesting to make her the final girl, you know, and she's in this situation because she had sex. So it's kind of an interesting take. I'm not saying she's the only one. I'm sure there's been others that have had sex in movies that were final girls, but it's not I like I can't name you five right now, okay? Uh, Butcher Baker, uh, Lee, you should review Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. I've never even heard of that one, Horde Horror. I said Hodor. <laughs> so many artistic looking shots in here. And you know what? I, I'll be the first to admit because this movie's so divisive. Some people, they would say style over substance, but I think it's the opposite. I think this movie has so much substance in it. And it falls in line with that ambiguity the substance is there if you look for it you know that's why there's probably quite a few essays on this movie on youtube because there's so much to dive into so many theories to be had uh gaming with jake how did you feel about slumber party massacre 3 honestly i haven't watched that one yet i've i've, I've reviewed the first two uh, I plan on reviewing the, the... I've waited because I want to wait until I'm ready to review it. So that's why I'm waiting to watch it. But uh, you let me know. Is it as good as the first two? I like. I love the first two almost equally. She did it all for the nookie. Yeah, so here's a nice surprise too. Again, another kind of horrific scene where it's not a jump scare. You know, there's really no music being played. But you think they're having this nice moment with each other, and then all of a sudden, um, he puts the chloroform over, over her mouth. Okay, this scene right here, and it's everything. This scene's a con the music, uh, what's going on, the setup, how he's explaining the rules to her. You know, there, there's so many different cogs in the wheel of uh any scene in a movie especially when it's as important as i would say this is the most important scene in it follows you know because so much is going on here this is where we explain the audience um what uh what is going on who is coming after them the rules of how to beat it and they give just enough you know they don't give too much and uh, you know if you were like over analyzing this movie and i guarantee you some people have you could look around like look at this frame right here let me let me click it over like look at this frame right here it's there's very little color except for jay you know with her her underwear which symbolizes sex um it's funny that that's the one thing that has color in the shot and mostly everything else around her is you know muted muted tones uh, earth tones you know it, it, I guarantee you there's there's uh, videos that you know they address that and you can take from it what you will I mean look at that look at all this scenes lit too it's really creepy looking what's up Polly Chris, what's up, brother? I hate this version of Randy Meeks. <laughs> oh, my God. This is like the opposite of Randy Meeks. <laughs> the, 
There are rules to surviving uh, a sex horror movie. Let me put on my subtitles. Hey, subs or no subs, guys? Do you like subtitles? Now, when I'm watching this in a theater, I didn't know if they were going to show it because there's a lot of um, is it or isn't it, you know, before this scene. This is the one scene, not well, not the only scene, but it's the first scene where they literally show you it. You, like, there's no question because what you're about to see is creepy as hell. A buck naked woman just walking slowly at you you know and guys pay attention to this too like this this woman some might say she's attractive you know he didn't put this grotesque figure coming after her he he put somebody that so that could be somebody that you know that she knew in the past and seeing somebody that you knew in the past naked coming after you because remember the rules what he said earlier it could be somebody that you love it could be somebody that you don't know it could be anybody you know and it's all kind of a psychological thing but it's really coming at you So in this situation, I think the slow, I'm not going to call it a zombie because that's not what it is, but the slow uh, protagonist is creepier. Like, I don't think for the tone of this movie, it would have worked to have it running after them. Not to say that it can't run because I think there is a couple scenes in this movie where it does run. But it, it, that, those are the scenes that aren't as scary to me. It's the scenes where they're, slowly moving or they're not moving at all like the freaking um like a scene at the i don't want to like spoil anything because a couple of you might not have seen this but the, like there's a scene at the end of the movie where I, uh, it is just standing there you could tell that david robert mitchell um he had a certain cadence to the the dialogue in this movie too. He, you could tell. You, you ever watch a movie and you can kind of tell that the actors have been coached uh, by the director. This is how I want this scene to play out, you know. Because a lot of these uh, these scenes, these lines of dialogue would probably be like if they were on just like regular TV, they'd probably be delivered a little bit more. I don't know, um, upbeat. But everything's kind of a cadence and uh you know that go that goes all the way back to when they started making movies um it's funny that i can compare this to the tv show the incredible hulk okay and you're like how in the hell is lee gonna tie it follows to the incredible hulk tv show but i'm here to do it okay and and um i was watching the behind the scenes and they were talking about bill bixby and about um uh johnson i can't remember the producer of the show and he told bill bixby when you say your lines i want you to say it like this with a pause in between each line you know a, a certain rhythm you know because what that does is it keeps the um the viewer constantly in touch with the movie or the show it keeps them pressing forward whereas if you state a line like this and you keep backing off or you don't have like a certain rhythm to the line it can kind of throw your audience off and they can check out so there's there's definitely like a science behind it and so that's you can tell that's kind of what he did here i want you guys to kind of be just monotone i want this whole movie to feel uh uneasy like something's off you know Uh, Trina says, fast moving zombies scare me more. I feel like a show w uh, 
a slow one wouldn't cr uh, creep me out. I would just click. Uh, <laughs> I would just dick kick it and then run away. Funny enough, when I was like, we all remember like our first scares, things that really got under our skin when we were young. And I think that's the moment when we were the most scared. And I remember it was like slow moving uh, scenes or images that really like, like um, I didn't see Night of the Living Dead when I was young, but I saw a certain movie that was kind of like that where they had like slow moving zombies and they had like the, the creepy yellow eyes and it freaked me out like big time. And uh, even like what's interesting about this movie too is you have characters moving slowly, but you also have like this, this scene with the camera moving slowly, just slowly in on Jay, you know? Yeah, you just missed it. But yeah, so David Robert Mitchell used every tool at his disposal to to scare the audience. You know, it wasn't just uh, jump jump scares. He had probably like at least a dozen different things that he used, you know? And one of them definitely was the camera. Uh, inevitability. You know, you know something bad's going to happen. Uh, you just don't know when it's going to happen. And, and John Carpenter was pretty much the master at this. You know, when, when John Carpenter was in his stride, my mind, almost untouchable. He was that good in his prime. Um, and, you know, I think every director, they have their, their, their drop, you know. Um, and John Carpenter definitely had his, I think, in the 90s. But, uh, man, I'd say like mid-70s to like late 80s, maybe even mid-80s, just boom, boom, boom. Just constantly putting out great stuff. It's creepy stuff, you know? John Carpenter could really scare an audience. And he even stated this, like, um, every director in his heart of hearts, even if he's not a horror director, wants to scare the shit out of an audience. You know? And I believe that. I do believe that. I think that is a challenge for a director to to make an, a, a movie that like I, I think that's part of the reason why maybe Danny McBride and David Gordon Green did Halloween because th they have more of a, a comedy background especially Danny McBride but there's something cool about taking a character like Michael Myers and making you know a, a just bona fide died in the wool horror movie with very little comedy Yeah, again, camera just slowly moving. Look at that. Just all the way through this movie, the camera's just constantly in motion, you know? Until it lands on something that's there to get under your skin. Right here. This scene right here. You see this old lady. It's going to lock in on this old lady coming towards the camera. Uh, and you don't know. You don't know if it could be it. Or it might just be a, an old lady that's, uh, you know, has dementia or something like that, you know? I worked um, in an assisted living facility, and that old lady really reminds me of some of the stuff I used to see when I was, uh, when I worked there. Uh, <laughs> what I miss, nothing. Is that a joke? <laughs> I, I'll show you exactly where we're at. I just, I just showed you. Hold on. Yeah, there you go. Slow moving camera. That's what you're seeing right now, okay, Lindsay? <laughs> this, another scene that feels like Halloween, you know? Fate, the, the fate scene in, in the first Halloween. Okay, pay attention to the music in this scene. The music is telling you to, uh, to hold on because this shit's about to get really fucking scary. And that's as professional as I can say that. I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this up just a hair. I got it. I love this freaking score. You know, it's like there's a rhythm to it. You know. Have you guys ever thought about what if they swapped a score? Like, what if they put the score for this movie? in like the first Halloween. It would work. Do you guys, I mean, isn't that kind of 
that's kind of a, a cool thought, you know? Did I just say I made a cool thought? Listen to that. Hold on. Here we go. Theater of the mind. Because it's an old lady, okay? So what's she going to do to her? You don't know. But David Robert Mitchell, I think his goal in this movie was to... Um, scare the shit out of the audience without actually having like uh, an impact shot you know uh, and I'm tr- I'm sitting here thinking out loud um, if there are any scenes of violence like like you know stabbing or um, um, bludgeoning there's very little of that it's mostly just uh horrific imagery you know like there, there's a scene later and i can well I'll, I'll address it when we get to it but there's a lot of imagery in this movie that really just gets under your skin yeah and amstel you're right you could actually put the the theme for halloween in this movie and it would kind of work you know I think the score for this movie is perfect for this movie. Don't get me wrong. But it would be cool if they actually put this score in a different horror movie. It might be it'd be an interesting experiment, I think. I think putting another score in Halloween is insulting, and that's coming from someone not too fond of Halloween at the moment. <laughs> well, no, you're not wrong. Uh, Halloween is perfect because of its score. That's one of the reasons why it's perfect. It, it, that score, if you took that score out of Halloween... It would ruin the movie. As a matter of fact, that test has been proven because John Carpenter, before he composed the score, he took uh, he took the movie, a print of the movie, to 20th Century Fox. No score. And they said, pass. It, it didn't work. So that told him how important music is. And then he just goes and creates like one of the most iconic scores ever made. Uh, you could put the theme for impact... Uh, Empire Records in this movie and it wouldn't make it better or worse. Silly, silly. Um, where are you at timestamp? Uh, Trina, hold on. Let me let me get you a timestamp. Uh, display. We are at 32 minutes and 15 seconds. 32 minutes, 15 seconds. Right there. That's where we're at. And look at this um, this cinematography too. You know, just very foggy and hazy. Especially the scene where every time like Jay's in front of a mirror, it's really like foggy and hazy. Um, this scene right here always reminds me of Halloween when he's watching the the old. That looks like a probably a nineteen early nineteen eighties TV. He's watching something in black and white. Like Halloween. So it, it almost bars too much from Halloween, if I'm being honest. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, now that I have a break, I can tell you about my experience of watching this movie for the first time, okay? Um, hold on. So... I remember uh, seeing the the marketing for this movie, and um, I guess kind of like The Empty Man, I thought it was going to be another like throwaway type horror movie. Plus, David Robert Mitchell wasn't a name; like this was his first movie. Uh, and, and I want to talk a little bit about David Robert Mitchell's career as well. But um, then I started hearing some some ruckus about the movie so i think i saw it a a little bit after it came out i'm not sure but maybe it was from the the ads on tv or something but there was something that grabbed my attention i was like okay i think i need to go see this and um i lived in um let's see 2015 because we saw it in orlando 2015 i lived in georgia how in the hell did i I know because i know i saw it in orlando i think maybe we were on vacation or something like that maybe that's why i saw it late but 
we went to like this massive uh, theater with this huge parking structure. Have you ever been to one of those malls that if you want to go see a movie, you got to get there at least 30 minutes early just so you can get time to get from your car to the actual seat? Probably an hour because you, if you want to get snacks. So the, the traffic was insanely crazy. I, 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 the, the, the memory is so vivid in my mind. The traffic was insanely crazy. I got my daughter and my son. Um, my wife didn't want to go for some reason. So my, my daughter and my son went and we were late already. You know, we were like, we were like late. And you know how they have like previews at the beginning of a movie. Thank God. We got to the parking structure. We literally got out of the car and we are, I mean, booking it like, like, like we're running track, you know? And we, the second we sat down was the opening shot of the movie. I, thankfully, I didn't really miss that much. But man, I hate I hate when I do that, when I miss part of the movie that I really want to see. Ashley, what's up? Uh, Jason and I are finally joining. Yes, I'll get you a, I'll get you a timestamp. Hold on. Um, I would imagine we're at like 35 minutes. Let me see. Um... Yeah, 30, 36 minutes, pretty much. Um, so they have like two different types of male figures in this movie. You got Keir Gilchrist, who plays Paul, I believe, which is another name in Halloween. And he's the uh, the innocent guy. He's not the bad boy. And this, hey, this is a tale old as time, right, guys? Okay? And you women, you always tend to like the bad boy. I don't know why. It happens. But... Paul's not the bad boy. He's the sweet kid. And uh, he, he's, you know, he's really like, he's got the hots for Jay. And uh, there's a reason they have both of these archetypes in the movie because they come into play later in the movie. Um, and then there's the, the, other, the other kid, which I forget his name. But yeah, he's the bad boy, you know? <laughs> you can miss half of this and not miss that much. I'm loving it, okay? I'm. I, it's like McDonald's. I'm loving it. I hate that I said that. Oh my god. They guys just the ba da ba ba ba. Every time I hear that, I want to punch a freaking donkey in the face. I hate that freaking corporate bullshit. Oh, and, and yet I go to McDonald's all the time for breakfast because they do have the best um, egg McMuffin. Okay really freaky scary scene coming up here okay here we go this scene right here damn this scene right here is pretty let me see if i can adjust my yeah there you go yeah yeah i remember seeing this scene and not knowing because that's the thing too i love that you never know what to expect in this movie this isn't one killer that looks like jason Voorhees or freddy krueger it could look like something completely different every single time you know like you could see cronenberg doing a movie like this it would come out different but yeah but yeah and then you got this image of this naked girl urinating and she has half her bra showing. And I remember this scared the living shit out of me when I saw it in the theater. I've never, I've never been scared like this before. It was just, it was unique. You know what I mean? And if you told me that this didn't scare you and you thought it was silly, I'd believe you. Because, you know, when I explain it, it does sound kind of silly. But, and probably every time I see it since, it's not as effective. But when you first see this, not knowing what to expect... It's it's a freaking punch to the gut. It is. You know, and this is one of those one-two punch scares because they scare you with that, but then they don't let up because then you got her sitting against the wall and then something's about to come through the door. Or is it if you haven't seen it? <laughs> Hmm. Wildcats. I'll give you guys a taste every now and then. I was gonna try to hook this up to um, 
to Jolene over there. Um, just because, just have you guys ever wanted to watch a newer movie in like VHS format? Because that's what I would kind of call it, like VHS format. Even though I would have it hooked up through, I guess, the Blu-ray player. There's something cool. Like this movie would be great to watch in a, like a grainy VHS type vibe. I think. If I could get away with it, with it I'd probably watch everything for my live stream, my patron live streams uh, on Jolene over there. I don't want to show too much because then I don't want to get it taken down. But but you can't help but love Paul. You know, he's a good guy. And he's there for her the whole time. Like the other guy, not at all. You know, the other guy's he's pretty selfish. Whereas Paul, I mean, he is by Jay's side the entire movie. Here you go, guys. I'm going to give you that. Here you go. I got Halloween 2018 and Midsommar on VHS tape. Is it actually the movie on a VHS tape, Dark Light? Don't open the door. Here you go. <laughs> like, what the? Where did this guy come from? <laughs> It could be anything. That's what I love about this. You know? And then you got the other dude, you know, the the, the lady killer, smoking pot, right? Amstel's still stuck on 1982. Doesn't this playground remind you of Halloween Kills? <laughs> I never noticed that. It kind of does. But they shot this in Detroit. Um, now, can you guys think of any other directors that have had only one movie that really made a mark, like a big mark? And, you know, you can say that this movie's divisive, and it is, but people are still talking about it. Like, big time, people are still talking about it. If you go through horror groups, I, I would wager that at least three times a week It Follows pops up. There's something about the movie, and maybe it is the divisive nature of it, but so many horror movies come and go, and they're just kind of lost in the ether, and nobody talks about them anymore. And they might have a little bit of a heyday at the beginning, and everybody's talking about it. Have you seen that? And then, like, a year later, it's gone. Nobody's talking about it. But there's something about It Follows that never dies. It Like, I literally think 20 years from... From its release date, people will still be talking about It Follows, you know, because of how unique this movie is. And you got to admit, still to this day, nothing like it. Nothing like it. You know, you could say that it's an A24 type movie, but it's still, you know, on an island all its own. But getting back to my point about David Robert Mitchell, you know, he's... This is his, his movie that made a mark. And then he did Under the Silver Lake after this a few years later. And man, after I saw this movie, I was dying to see what David Robert Mitchell was going to put out next. Like, I wanted to know. Like I, like, I will be there day one. Let me see what this guy's going to put out next. Because he, he really just nailed it with this movie for me. I just loved his style. Uh, you know, I just loved his vision, everything about this movie. And Under the Silver Lake came out, and I'm going to be honest with you guys, I didn't even bother watching it until maybe even a year later. There was no hoopla around the movie. It wasn't a horror movie at all. I did see the movie, didn't care for it. I was like, damn. And another director that has had this same exact um, situation is Donnie Darko, um, Richard Kelly. Richard Kelly has done other movies, but none of them 
are even remotely close to Donnie Darko uh, in quality, in uh, cult film um, status. Uh, you know, it has been 20 years. And Donnie Darko is still talked about just as much, probably even more, you know, because when Donnie Darko first came out, there were people talking about it, but not that much. It was one of those movies that was kind of found years later, like, you know, kind of discovered like, oh, wow, that it, it, don't you love when movies do that, too? They slowly catch on through word of mouth. And, you know, they often, they often say like word of mouth is like the most powerful form of um of uh, marketing because when it's word of mouth it usually means it's there, it, there's some greatness there you know it's not that front bumper type of marketing where uh morbius is coming out and everybody's going to talk about it for 10 minutes probably about how much uh it sucks but you know even bad movies they get a marketing push at the beginning and people are talking about them but then they're like morbius i guarantee you nobody's gonna be talking about morbius um probably pretty quickly after and i haven't seen it yet but i, I just have a feeling um but word of mouth hits you know they just keep growing and growing and, and it, the original halloween was a word of mouth hit it was not a big hit when it first came out as a matter of fact john carpenter had pretty much you know he had pretty much wiped his hands of it given up okay another movie in the can it didn't really do that much let's move on to the, the fog you know that's all he saw it as is i got an i i got a uh, an offer to make the fog and then as he was making the fog all of a sudden news started picking up about halloween and, and people started talking about it word of mouth word of mouth was a really big thing back in the 70s and 80s and uh it just never let up and it became massive and then okay now we got to make a sequel and which is my next question for you guys like could they make a sequel to this could a sequel to this work with this idea i mean i think the obvious answer is with the idea absolutely because that's a pretty universal idea you know a, a, a metaphor for stds i mean and it could happen this is just detroit it could happen Anyway, it could be like a, a freaking virus. It could be like the pandemic. It, you know, it could spread like wildfire. So I'd be curious because a sequel to this, if David Robert Mitchell wasn't doing it, then it could easily fall on its face. Aaron Click says it's supposed to have a nightmare feel. Uh, it's like when no one's around to help you in some of your nightmares. Um, Derek says it could work, but it would probably be, probably be, blah, 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 probably be crap. Like the descent two, the, uh, the descent two is so interesting to me because they go back to the same location. Uh, they have Juno and Sarah there, but somehow the movie was crap. The, it's like the idea well had just run dry. It even doesn't even look as good. It looks too bright. There's something off about it. The cinematography is not as good. Yeah. It's crazy that the quality drop from The Descent to The Descent 2. And that's what I would be afraid of if they tried to make a sequel to It Follows. Okay, I'm going to address that. Um, Brett's saying Mother Mayhem the rules definitely do change a lot in this movie now th um, that kind of falls in line with ambiguity to me this is my th I'm not saying I'm right or wrong I'm just saying this is my um, take on that matter how the, the rules can change because we don't know all the rules the, the rules that um, Jay's boyfriend gave her were, were the rules that he knew but he was no expert. He was just trying to get rid of it, you know? So there's a lot of blanks that you could fill in there, you know? And to me, as far as the rules go, I can't think of anything that like really jumps outside of what the, the core format of the movie is. So 
I could give it a pass. And at the end of the day, too, it's not something that jumped out at me I'm, as I'm watching the movie. I'm like, hey, that doesn't make sense. You, I, I kind of was just kind of in that world. Fo- oh, I love this scene. You know? I got verbal diarrhea. I apologize, guys. Um, yeah, this scene right here. Uh, camera, just a constant spin. You know, this is another technique. Instead of a slow zoom in, you got a spin at just the right pace to where you're trying to catch something in the, like like that girl work, walking towards the camera right now. You know, could that be it? Uh, and again, you got this freaking great music playing. Let me turn it up. It's almost, it, it almost sounds like a heartbeat, you know? Kind of reminds me of the beginning of Teen Wolf. <laughs> 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 which teen wolf is everybody tell me everybody can agree that teen wolf is great right teen wolf is not divisive okay what would be devices divisive is if you said teen wolf was better than back to the future do any of you think that teen wolf is better than back to the future let's get written it down to the real talk okay I prefer Teen Wolf over Back to the Future. And don't get me wrong, I freaking love Back to the Future. Matter of fact, we did a patron live hangout for Back to the Future. Guys, didn't we do Teen Wolf 2? I think we did Teen Wolf, not Teen Wolf 2, T-O-O, but Teen Wolf as well. If you're going to be vague, just skip it all together. (laughs) I love that you're here, Lindsay. I love it. Give me thing, just skip it. Okay. My my six year old just came out. Teen Wolf, baby. There you go. Back to the Future. Per- yeah, they say Back to the Future is the perfect movie. Like, there's no every scene counts. I don't know, Lee. I'm afraid to say anything bad about Teen Wolf. I know you love that movie to pieces. I do, Erica. You know I do. Jeff. That's the that's the uh, that's the jerk's name. Um, we did, yeah, we did Teen Wolf and we did Back to the Future. Hey, didn't we do Commando too? We did Commando like a couple years ago, didn't we? That was a fun one. You want to get your daughter back. You're going to cooperate, right? Wrong. (laughs) Fucking awesome. There you go. It's the Levi moment. So here's another scene here too where like something could be like yeah like the girl walking behind them as they're talking so you got like that added bit of tension Levi's watching it look at him see that's how, that's when you know it's good because Levi's watching it he is the he's the best part of any viewing. Let off some steam, Bennett. <laughs> Levi says hi. Let's see how close I can get Levi to the to the camera. Levi's typing right now. It follows is actually amazing. And Lindsay's wrong. That's what he just typed. put elmo there there you go what if what if uh instead of it it was elmo coming at them would that change the dynamic don't say it <laughs> it would make it better whack, whack, whack. <laughs> i'm coming after you I had to use the Back to the Future beginning music because I couldn't afford the other music. Give me a kick of beer. 
I wish I had some powdered donuts near me. See, I like that they didn't make Jeff like a complete douche. Like he's he's an okay guy. He's he's normal, you know. He's not Trent from Friday the Thirteenth. <laughs> I just I was looking for an open. My open was there. I took it. Okay, I took it. He's not Trent. Royal douche. That's what that's what Trent is. He's a he's a royal douche. Okay, get him off my screen. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a trivia question. It's still a deuce. There you go. <laughs> Are you talking about Jeff? <laughs> Damn it. I'm trying to think of a trivia question. Shit. All right. We're going to do, because we always do a giveaway for patron live streams. So... I'm going to show you what you could win. Hold on. All right. So, Drum Dumb's patrons. Uh, let, let me think. I'm going to think of a trivia question, but tonight's prize will be a sealed copy of Hell Knight, the Scream Factory edition of Hell Knight. Is this out of print? Do I want to freaking give this away? I can't take it back, though. I can't take it back. Let me see. Hold on. Let me see how much Hell Knight sells for on Amazon. Hold on just a sec. If this sells for $100, I swear to fucking God. I swear to fucking God. Okay, hold on. Hell Knight. Have you guys seen Hell Knight? Uh, Neil Marshall directed the, de the Descent. The Descent. Okay. All right, hold on. Hell Knight. Okay, Hell Knight Blu-ray. Hold on, here we go. Because I know some of those Shout Factory editions, they've uh, got... Uh-oh, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, my God, hold on. Okay, okay. Uh, they, they only have the international editions on Amazon. Unless it's the... Let me see if they have the DVD. Uh-oh. This might be worth a pretty penny, guys. Then Google how much it follows sells for. Fingers crossed, Hell Knight sells for now. <laughs> Hold on. So it's not, let me, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll just Google. That's what I'll do. Let's see. Hell Knight shopping. That's what I'll do. Hell Knight Blu ray, and we're going to go shopping. Shout Factory Edition, uh, you can get it through. So, yeah, it's like 30 bucks. So, okay. All right. I'm, let, me, let me think of a trivia question, okay? Let me think of a trivia question. Uh, I, I and Jason saw Hell Knight. Yeah, I love this movie. I love Hell Knight. I'm telling you, if you haven't seen this, this is a freaking treat. Okay. Lindsay, have you seen this? This is really good. Because one thing I love about Hell Knight is that it has like, um, like the score sounds like it could have been in one of those like 60s horror movies, 50s horror movies. <laughs> is it better than It Follows? That is a tough question because I do love this freaking movie so damn much. So damn much. Like it's got Linda Blair in it, okay? It's got Linda Blair. It's got the um, what's the the guy from Friday the Thirteenth Part Four is in it that was in the shower. Don't drop the soap. That guy. The the hunky boy. Yeah. And it's got like creatures in it, so it's kind of like a creature slasher. But yeah, it's it's great. It's great.
All right, hold on. I, I got a question. It's coming. It's coming to me. Okay. Okay, I got a question. Here we go. <laughs> Stomach bug. Okay. Um, here's the question. Okay? This is a legit question. All right. Now, um, give me another movie that Make a Monroe was in that has a little bit of a nod to one of the Halloween movies. Okay? Pretty, I think, I think this is a pretty easy question. Give me another movie that Make a Monroe was in that has a nod to uh, a Halloween movie. Okay? And um, if you get the right answer, just message me on Patreon, and then I'll get your address, and I'll send this to you. Okay? Okay? Come on, this seems good. Hold on. There you go. Look at that. Am still got it. Amstel, you are the man. So Amstel, send me a uh, a message on um, Patreon, okay? And then I can uh, I'll get your your information. The guest because there's a uh, um, Halloween three. Um, Kind of an homage to Halloween 3 at the end of the guest in the, the um, what is that, like a haunted house? It's like a haunted house at the end of, uh, you know, like a carnival haunted house. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah, Mecca Monroe was was in that. She was, she was really good, too. The guest is amazing. Freaking love that movie. Adam Wingard. Yeah. <laughs> And the shitteth is hitting the faneth right now. But yeah, watch freaking Hell Night if you haven't seen it. I'm telling you, it's a blast. It's really good. It's, it's an old 80s um, slasher movie. Which are the best slasher movies. So you've seen the guest. Okay, all right. Now is the in this scene, guys, is it running? No, it's not. It's yeah, she was walking slow after them. So yeah. I was thinking in this scene it might be running, but it's not. So I don't think it runs throughout the whole movie. This scene always makes me think of Children of the Corn when she when she hits that freaking cornfield. So at this point, Jay is um in her mind, she's up shit creek without a paddle. Like what you know, and she goes through this process of how do I how do I get rid of this? There's the only way I can get rid of this is to pass it on. So psychologically it's it's interesting because it forces a otherwise good person to do something that's bad and could ultimately kill somebody so you're basically having to choose somebody else's life over your own or choose your own life over somebody else uh rather and uh that's believable because even good people you know brass tacks when that uh choice is presented right in front of you it's probably a hard thing to say I choose their life over mine unless it's your child you know if it's your your child then of course you're gonna yeah but I mean would you uh, give your life up for a complete stranger I think good people might not even make that decision you know so I guess that's another thing I like about it follows is it just you're constantly having these um, these questions presented at you as you're watching it. Mm. 
But in this situation, of all places, she passes it to Jeff uh, in the hospital. <laughs> uh, here's a good question right here. What if you kill yourself? Does it take that as a win and move on to the next? That is, you know, and I could see like if they had a sequel, they might even like present a question like that because that is something that we don't know. And I don't, that's something that's not really explored in the movie, which I'm surprised they didn't explore that, that option. Um, if you kill yourself. Um, thinking out loud here. Now, I, I think that would be the ultimate way to beat it. And, and I, that would be like a logical ending to the movie. Like, what if Jay just killed herself at the end of the movie because she knew that that was the way to finally win? But that's a tough sell to a studio to say, hey, we're going to have our main character, our final girl, take her own life at the end of the movie. You know? Uh, that's a downer. And, and a lot of times, especially in America, they don't like downer endings. You know? Yep, and so she's uh, she's passing it on. And then Jeff, so she's basically, like, I guess her and Jeff have this thing. She's basically using Jeff so because she knows Jeff's going to pass it on to somebody else. Can you pass it to more, pass it on more than once? Like, hit up a fraternity, boom. Uh, you bought yourself some time. Yeah, that's, a, that's another good scenario. You know, and these are young people. So if you put this in, like, a college setting, oh, my God. I do like that they set this in like Detroit, you know, kind of a, a rougher type setting than in like, you know, kind of a glitzy college setting. But it would, I think it could work if you did put it in, um, you know, an alternate setting like that. And so you got Jeff working his magic and then he's going to pass it on. And now there is a, I will admit there is a section that I was a little confused about. Um, one, and, and I guess we'll address it once we get to there. Because why do they show, they show Jeff talking to those girls so you know he was trying to pass it on. So if I'm right here, I'm thinking it didn't work, which why even... So he's basically telling her that he didn't pass it on. And let me know if I'm wrong on that, guys. But So then she's put in a situation where she ends up going out to that boat and she passes it on uh, there. But when I first saw this, I thought that Jeff did pass it on. You know? Fight, love, uh, fight club level confused. <laughs> Uh, Horde Horror Halloween says weird movie but good uh, now I, I assume he's talking about It Follows and not Fight Club uh, f <laughs> what about necrophilia oh my god <laughs> I don't think that would work if I'm being honest Jason Reese what's up man how you doing you gonna be at Spooky when is Spooky is it May or June Levi, I was looking for Levi. He was laying right behind me. So, guys, my uh, my granddaughter spent the night at the house uh, for the first time last night. It was so free. I was, but I slept in the room with her. Uh, you know, she sleeps on like this. Uh, we have, um, what do you call that? Like a, it's kind of like a playpen type deal. You know, 
you 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 got some mothers in the chat. What, what do you call that? But I I she was sleeping in that, and I was sleeping in the bed in the room because, and I couldn't sleep at all. Like every freaking hour, I kept waking up, and I would like flash my uh, my flashlight on my phone just to make sure she was breathing. <laughs> Did you guys ever do that? I I I was freaking out. I was like, I want to make sure she's okay. But yeah, she spent the night last night, and then. Um, it was it was such a blessing and she woke up at like five o'clock this morning and i was just like waiting for her to wake up it was almost like waiting for christmas morning bassinets thank you that's what it was it was like a big bassinet but and i was just waiting for her to wake up and then she woke up at five and so i i walked over to her and she like turned around and she looked up at me and she smiled and it just freaking brightened it was like the greatest thing ever you know it's like morning little delilah it was oh it's just just having her spend the night and i got to spend all this time with her yesterday and it was so great so i've 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 like been kind of down today because i've missed her all day you know that's the that's the problem they always say being grandparents is like the best because you get the best of both worlds but i guess the bad thing is sometimes it's not fun giving them back you know uh yeah i still do youngest is two and a half so expect that to pass any day, any day now. <laughs> this scene's freaking creepy too. When um, she sees Jeff going into the house. Now, yeah, here's another scene that you can kind of dissect too. Like, is Jeff like sleepwalking? Because when he, like, his mother is it, or is like can it be a couple things like is what she's seeing jeff being part of it and his mother i don't know it's kind of, it's kind of strange so she's going across the street to try to save jeff um but jeff is the one that gets killed here so was jeff sleepwalking i have questions uh, how terrifying would X be compared to Hereditary or The Witch? Um, X isn't really what I would call too scary. Um, yeah, I wasn't scared at all. I mean, it does have some heavy violence in it um, at the end or in the final act. But um, as far as like comparing it to like Hereditary, Hereditary is definitely scarier. And The Witch... Yeah, forget about it. Both those movies are much scarier than X. Having said that, I prefer X over those movies. And and look, guys, here's my thing when it comes to scary movies. And by the way, this freaking scene right here. Hold on. That's freaking crazy shit right there. <laughs> like, th- to me, that scares me. That's creepy shit right there, okay? But, um... Some people, they rate a movie on if it's scary or not, a horror movie. It's, that automatically means it's either good or bad if it's scary. I don't look at horror movies that way because when I'm, if I'm being honest, maybe 1% of uh, horror movies are I find like really scary. Like The Exorcist, for sure. Um, I did a freaking, uh, I did a top 10 like scariest horror movies list. And I can, right now, I can only think of like The Exorcist. Like, the Exorcist is legit freaking, still to this day, I think one of the most terrifying movies out there. Uh, matter of fact, let me know down in the comments, guys, or in the uh, the chat. Give me uh, a couple movies that you think are genuinely scary, okay? Because it's hard for me to even come up with, like, on the top of my head, like, three movies that are genuinely scary, you know? Some would even say, like, the first Halloween when it first came out was pretty damn scary. And, but on the other on, on the flip side of that, I can tell when a movie is effective in terms of scaring an audience, even even though it might not scare me. I, like it follows. I think in terms of putting a, scenes together to scare an audience, I think it works. You know, I think it achieved its goal of at least creeping people out. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> maybe a little bit. I don't know. But yeah, most of the time movies don't scare me. So I don't I don't really make the act of scaring me physically a barometer. But if I think it's like it can scare an audience, then yeah, maybe that's a barometer. 
Okay? I know I'm not making sense, but that, yeah, I think you see what I'm saying. Eden Lake, Polly. Yeah, Eden Lake's got... See, I would put Eden Lake in like the... I don't like torture porn. I don't like that term. It's like a torture movie. Um, but I don't find torture stuff scary. <coughs> like, do you guys find torture stuff scary? I, I, I mean, I cringe at it, and I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to look at that. You know, like I was watching um, uh, Frontiers that's on Shutter, which is excellent, by the way. French horror movie. I was watching that um, yesterday. Uh, that has some of the most hard-edged scenes I've seen. Like, it's got some brutal-type stuff in it. Wasn't scared one bit. You know, it's just, to me, it's scary and torture are apples and oranges to me, you know. To me, scary is more of a, a mind type thing, you know. Shut it. Good. So, yeah, well, now we're at the scene where Jay, she's, uh, she realized, okay, I, this, I have to, I have to do this. So she's going to go out into this boat. And she's going to give it up so she can pass it on. Um, it doesn't really spell it out. But you might think that she didn't go through with it. And maybe that's why she's crying. Because then she has sex with Paul. And then Paul tries to pass it on to a prostitute. Um, this movie doesn't like it doesn't come right out and let you know Jay didn't do it. You just kind of have to do the math and put you know put the pieces together, which is fine. I, I like that. I like that. I like a movie that makes you kind of you, you kind of think have to think about it a little bit. And when I, I try to think about it, but nothing happens. <laughs> What is that t-shirt she's wearing? That's the first time I ever noticed that. Almost looks like Tank Girl. <laughs> uh, Aaron Click says, Torture in movies isn't usually scary to me, but the thought of actually being tortured is scary. That is a very, very fair point. If you were actually in that situation, yeah, that would be fucking scary. <laughs> she slept with a guy on the first day. The boat guy should have been a breeze. <laughs> Well, they didn't buy her popcorn, you know? <laughs> now, I can argue that, though, because, I mean, she's going on a date with the guy. She likes the guy. She's going to complete freaking strangers on a boat that might have beer bellies and freaking big beards, okay? You don't know. <laughs> And Paul's still trying to get it. You know, he's still trying. Bless his heart. <laughs> Poor Paul. Please, my Paul, I give you all. No keys. You have to drink every time I reference Halloween, okay? You'd be some drunk motherfuckers by the end of this. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> uh, let me see. Hold on. That's from Nightmare on Elm Street. What's from Nightmare on Elm Street? Free thinker. Uh, Texas, Chainsaw Massacre, The Hills Have Eyes. Yeah, those are kind of like torture-ish. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, 1978, is a um, scary movie. Now, Polly, I will say, when I was young, and usually when you're young, your barometer for scares is a little bit different than when you're an adult, but Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I saw that when I was pretty young, and yeah, that was some freaky scary shit so i guess that one kind of uh proves that point that torture can be scary i guess because it's more like psychological torture it's not you know they hit the the worst thing they actually did to her was like they hit her over the head with a hammer which is bad but like that's it by that time you already freaked the fuck out anyway the boat was definitely rocked <laughs> <laughs> She didn't know Jeff's name, nor had she even been in his house. They were strange. That is true, but I will say, is it possible? Are there women that go out on a date? Um, let's just say um, the um, 
the magic is happening. You know, they're getting the butterflies. You know, there's a chemistry there. Sometimes, and sometimes it happens. It does happen. Whereas there's no chemistry in that boat scene. None whatsoever. You know, she, it, it, she looks like she's getting ready to bite a bullet. Okay? But see, that's the thing I, I love about this movie. Is that you can have those discussions. You can have those debates. You know? Whereas a lot of straightforward cookie cutter horror movies... You might not uh, get to have as well thought out debates, you know? <laughs> and sometimes debates are useless <laughs> and futile. <laughs> Erica, I saw Halloween when I was really young. I didn't sleep for days. Yeah, well, that was kind of my situation with um, Halloween 4. And you guys have heard me share that story umpteen times. But... That's I can I, I'm not even gonna show you that, but you got the freaking guy. Then now they say that's her dad. Can you imagine that? You see your dad naked on a roof. You know, <laughs> that's fuck. That's some heavy shit. So it's still coming after her. It doesn't feel pity or remorse. And it absolutely will not stop. I love this track. This song. Well, let me turn it up a little bit. I think I already passed it. Damn it. So now they're going to the pool scene. Uh, the, the, uh, the finale. The epic finale of the movie. God, this has flown by, guys. Dave, what's up, man? Dave Vanderhoff in the house. How you doing, brother? Nice to see you. Uh, Adrian James, original Carrie. It still gives me shivers watching it. Yeah. The original, yeah. The Palmas Carrie. Still, but yeah, there's the music. Still very effective. Love this. Yeah, my, if you can get this score on vinyl, it's so good. <clears throat> See, Dave likes it. Great movie. It follows. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Enough when his old man balls hang out of his side of his underwear. <laughs> <clears throat> we've had a steady 30 people watching it's awesome that all you guys are watching this movie with me Except for maybe a couple. So some of you might be might just be listening, but yeah. Like, are you guys watching this along with me? Give me give me a yes or a no. Or a maybe. <laughs> Levi. And more importantly. When you are you watching it from the Blu-ray, and did you get the slipcover? Okay, did you get the slipcover? Because that's important, you know. I saw a Star Wars meme about slipcovers the other day, and it had Yoda. I can't remember what it was. Uh, oh yeah, yes. Not enough alcohol in the world would make me watch this again. I just put it on. Hell yes, I'm watching. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Not enough alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the alcohol. <laughs> See, what if I what if I watch it with that on? Does that make it better if you watch it with a Jason mask? <laughs> Streaming it on Prime, that's good. That's good. This is a good quality um, Jason mask right here, you know? It's, 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 
It's nice material, and more importantly, it's got Kane Hodder's signature on it, which is cool. But, yeah. And it says Kane Hodder Jason 789X. So as you can see, we're at the pool scene. Uh, watch it with your eyes closed and the sound off. You're good. There you go. That's what I was doing. <laughs> uh, Scotty Boy Rules says, yes, on DVD, it has a slipcover. Nice. Um, I do. I have the, uh, hold on. I never buy DVDs for newer movies, but funny enough, because they had the uh, the Dollar General Halloween Kills, I bought it, and one nice surprise is it does have a nice slipcover, you know? And because I got the 4K Steelbook, but I wanted, I still wanted that slipcover, so I kind of got the best of both worlds, you know? Is Halloween Kills better than It Follows? <laughs> no, there's a tough question. <laughs> Iconic shot right there. Uh, I think I just missed it. Yep, so it's coming down the hallway. Um, I always love like corridors in horror movies, you know, or like, like I think the boiler room in Nightmare on Elm Street is like the scariest, like what's the scariest location imaginable to you guys, okay? Like what's the scariest location? Because to me, I think the answer to that is the boiler room. In Nightmare on Elm Street. I can't think of a scarier location. Actually, if you were in Regan's um, Regan's bedroom when it's freezing cold in The Exorcist, I think that would be... Hey, maybe there's a top ten idea. Scariest locations imaginable. Okay? Uh, Aaron Lee, wouldn't this film look amazing in 4K? Yeah, it looks amazing on Blu-ray, too. I'm watching it on Blu-ray right now. That's um, That TV right there is my 3D TV. I've had that thing forever. It's a 47 inch, but I had to like pick cause it was in the Delilah's room in there and I had to grab it and bring it in here. It's heavy too. <clears throat> and so it is throwing shit at Jay. Now I tell you if I had, because as much as I love it follows, I think there could have been a better final showdown but I, I guess it begs the questions like, what do you do? You know, how do you beat it uh, besides often yourself? And again, if she killed herself, uh, that that doesn't make people too out. Like, I'm wondering if that thought even came into David Robert Mitchell's mind when he was writing the script for this. Like, I'll have that. That's the logical ending is she kills herself, you know. But. This is probably your most action-packed scene. And ironically, it's probably my least favorite of the movie. Although I could feel that. Like when he throws that thing. Uh, Scream 5 was hot garbage. Uh, hor now I wouldn't say that. It's not hot garbage. Cornfields. Yep, cornfields are scary. In the basement from We Are Still Here. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> 50 top 10 ideas that you still haven't done you you doofus that's me um she should have uh got electrocuted i like electric cuted i like that dave i don't believe uh much thought went into this story at all <laughs> or maybe or maybe too much thought went into it you know <laughs> damn it Paul uh, there's a long delay Greg being killed across the street 
was lifted from Glenn's death in Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, that's a good one. Thank you, Free Thinker. Good looking out on that one. And he's going to he's going to shoot it right in the head. Oh, boom. <laughs> I caught it just in time, too. <laughs> so So and that's the thing, too. You, you can literally you can shoot it to kill it. Or can you? Because this does have kind of an ambiguous ending. And she's got like a mark on her ankle. So it can reach out and grab you. <laughs> What's the runtime on It Follows? Uh, let me see. Hold on. Runtime is uh, an hour and 40 minutes. Pretty much an hour and 40 minutes. Uh little nice artistic shot right here. Uh, kind of reminiscing the shot with her hand over the, um, I guess, the, the, the flower or whatever it was earlier before the whole thing started. So kind of an echoing shot, I guess. Um, I suggested Cemetery for creeper lo creepy locations, but now I'm drawing a blank on what movie that has good ones. Cemetery is a good one for sure. Yeah, Cemetery is a really creepy place. It Follows 2, Followed Again. I've heard some names for like the sequel. And this is a scene where she's like, okay, Paul, I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> uh. Guys, I mean, we're wrapping this thing up, but man, we, I have a blanket just like that. Hold on. <laughs> the blanket that she's, I literally have a blanket that looks almost just like that. I swear to God. I swear to God. Okay. <laughs> but I can't believe we finally did it. This, this was the, uh, the, it follows. We, we planned this thing. I swear like maybe four or five months ago before I moved and, uh, we finally did it. So, um, I, I, I'm always looking for suggestions from you guys. Restraining order. That's hilarious. <laughs> for uh, future live hangouts. These are fun. I love hanging out with you guys and just shooting the shit and uh, telling lies and talking about movies. Um, uh, maybe next time we do a fun like 80s. And we don't even have to do horror. Like, like I said, we've done Back to the Future. We've done Teen Wolf. We've done Commando. Maybe we do Cobra or something like that. Or maybe, you know, or I don't know, maybe Terminator. Could be fun. You know, Breakfast Club, who cares, right? Could be fun. We could try to pick apart Breakfast Club. Dude Bro Massacre 3. There you go. So now they're wondering, like, did it work? And so then they, they, they tack on this extra scene of uh, Paul going to pass it to a prostitute. And maybe that's the, the thing, too. Like, you never know. You know, th there's that, that lingering thought in your mind. Like, it could still always be. Like, think about it this way, too. Like, what if they did beat it? But the thought was still there you know so you you live with it forever it's like this psychological thing that just looms over you for the rest of your life could, could it where could, could it be coming after me still i don't know you know because there's no definitive answer there's no like light that goes off neon light saying ding 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 ding, ding. you did it tell him what he's won johnny no there's none of that so you could spend the rest of your life just trying to fix an already solved problem, you know? Physical agony and all this distracts from mental suffering. 
uh, so that one is tormented by the wounds until the moment of death. That's exactly what I just said. What she read there was pretty much just what I said. Most terrible agony may not be the wounds themselves, but in knowing for certain that when in, within an hour, that uh, within 10 minutes, or within half of a minute, and now at this very instant, your soul will leave your body and you will no longer be a person. It's kind of in a way what I was just saying. You're going to spend the rest of your life worrying about this thing. You know, it's never going to leave you. It's psychologically going to fuck you up. So, and then, yeah, the last shot. Very Halloween-esque. Uh, and l- let me flip back here just for a sec so that way I don't get the copyright strike. But, yeah, so I'm going to click it back. Boom, okay. Okay. I like how this ends on an ambiguous note. And then you see the yeah, you see the guy walking behind them. You don't know. Could be it, you know? Love this movie. Love this movie. It's just so unique, you know? It's just so damn unique. And you never go for a small town hooker. Go with the big town. They have 20 Johns a day. <laughs> very true very true you know when i was in the military um when um we when we would deploy we would stop off in like germany and a lot of the guys would literally go downtown because they had hookers down there and they would literally go downtown and they would they said that it cost like 20 bucks or something like that which is crazy (laughs) <laughs> I guess it's kind of like Amsterdam too that you know um I guess prostitution is a lot more prevalent in other countries than it is here even though it's big here too but how did I get on prostitution I have no idea I blame you Lindsay okay guys this was freaking fun we did it we 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 I, I would not shut up I annoyed the the hell out of you talking about it follows I blew this movie pretty much but uh yeah it, it's I'm like that though. I like freaking weird uh, A24-ish, even though this isn't A24. I don't think it is. No, it's not. Um, yeah, I like I like movies like that. Like I guess you could call them like art house type movies. <coughs> but and my voice is going. But yeah, this was fun, guys. I'm gonna shoot a message out to you guys uh, over on the Patreon page. Uh, probably in the next couple days and we're going to figure out because I definitely want to start getting these things rolling more. Um, So I'd like to do another one at the end of like April. So I'll probably shoot a message out. I'll get you guys to uh, give me some ideas and maybe we'll do like a vote or something like that. We'll narrow it down. Okay. Because I like when we do non-horror stuff too because it's always fun like doing just like comedies uh, maybe an action movie, something like that. Mix it up, you know, because that's one thing I like about my Patreon page is it gets us away from horror all the time because I know we all live and breathe horror like crazy, but sometimes it's good to step outside of that and maybe try, you know, other genres. Because I'm a movie lover. I freaking love movies to death, you know? And uh, I grew up on um, every type of genre you can possibly imagine. We could even do like a Tarantino movie. You know, that could be a, that would, that could be a bass. A blast, a blast. Jesus, fuck. Okay. So, yeah, this was fun, Erica. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Polly. I appreciate that. So, you guys have a wonderful night. Um, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being awesome people and uh, my friends. And uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful night. I had a blast with you. 